Good evening and thank you for joining us. Tragic news to report tonight. A 15-year-old Lathrop student is dead at this hour due to an apparent electrical accident. The accident involved a dryer and according to state troopers, they were informed at about 1 a.m. that the boy had been found dead. Alaska State Trooper spokeswoman Megan Peters says, quote, most likely he went behind the dryer and came into contact with an unprotected electrical source. There were no witnesses at this scene, but foul play is not suspected in this case. Now the news center will have more as details become available. Okay, in other news this evening, oil tax legislation is now before the Senate floor in Juneau. Senators today were again debating a proposed overhaul of Alaska's oil tax structure. Amendments were proposed to raise the base tax rate from the current 25% to 35%. Studies indicate that if the tax rate was raised to and kept at 35%, the state could hold on to hundreds of millions of dollars more through 2019. Supporters say the bill will lead to more investment. Critics call it a giveaway with no assurance Alaska will see anything in return. The flatter, slightly regressive rate substantially simplifies auditing, comparison, and evaluation. The per barrel credit is based on production, not on related spending, and it protects the state from financial liability due to credits and low oil prices. And the flat rate also eliminates the issue of large-scale gas sales distorting the overall level of state revenues. The Senate Judiciary Committee continues discussions on a gun control bill after striking one of its most controversial parts. House Bill 69 by House Speaker Mike Chenault would make any future federal laws that ban assault weapons or require gun owners to register their weapons unenforceable in Alaska. The committee removed a section which would have made it a felony for federal officers to enforce certain gun regulations in the state of Alaska. The committee's chairman, Senator John Coghill, said he supported the idea but couldn't see how the state would actually pull off charging federal officers with felonies for enforcing federal laws. A village public safety officer in Manakodok on the, is on the Bristol Bay Coast was fatally shot Tuesday. State troopers say 42-year-old Leroy Dick was arrested for investigation of murder and the death of 54-year-old Thomas Madel. Troopers in Dillingham responded to a report of shots fired and found Madel dead outside a residence of an apparent gunshot wound. Madel was one of two village public safety officers based in Manakodok. Dick was jailed in Dillingham. A state court judge has ordered a 35-year-old accused killer to be transported to an Anchorage psychiatric facility to determine his state of mind when police say he strangled his former girlfriend to death last year. As we've reported, defense attorneys for Nairobi Chandler are calling into question his mental state when he allegedly killed 31-year-old Kaylin Bishop. Chandler, who faces charges of first-degree murder and three counts of evidence tampering, has been sent to the Alaska Psychiatric Institute for further evaluation. Court records allege Bishop had been trying to leave a contentious relationship with Chandler when she went missing and was later found dead along the Richardson Highway. Trial in his case is set for mid-June. A 47-year-old Fairbanks woman faces as much as 15 years in jail after she pleaded guilty to shooting her husband with a 22 caliber rifle last year. Christine Mills originally had been charged with attempted murder after her husband was hospitalized with five bullet wounds back in April 2012. She pleaded guilty to felony assault under the terms of the plea agreement struck recently with state attorneys. Mills is being held at Fairbanks Correctional Center without bail. She will remain in custody pending her sentencing hearing that's set for August. Well, there's been quite a lot of buzz around a local Fairbanks radio station. UAF student-run KSUA has been recognized by MTVU as the best college radio station in the nation. During the South by Southwest Music Festival in Austin, Texas, the radio station was surprised with the news by an MTV VJ or video jockey. Last year, KSUA placed third in the competition, which is based from votes, and this year decided to up the ante, even making this Harlem Shake video to gain votes. That certainly paid off when they received the first place spot this year, beating out other colleges in bigger communities. KSUA will get a chance to host a half-hour video music video show on MTVU to be filmed right here in Fairbanks, featuring music of their choice. It's great to get recognition, especially because of our community support, and those are the people who ended up voting for us. So. It's really great to be recognized by MTV, but also our community. Uh, it's actually re really great timing for us because we have been working on a local compilation CD that uh, includes um, a majority of Fairbanks local music, and we thought it'd be a really great idea to showcase all the talent that Fairbanks has to offer. 
So that was funny, huh? That was apparently the Harlem Shake. That right was there. the Harlem Shake. Yeah. I loved it. They told me that they had that, and I said, you need to send me the link because I have got to play it. So. Very good. All right, well, when we come back, we'll have our weekly military report. This week, sling low training in the Arctic, and I literally almost got blown away today. All right. <laughs> also, PETA is asking for cruelty charges and the death of a dog running the Iditarod. Those stories next. Stay with us. This edition of the Fairbanks Evening News is brought to you by Northland Hearing Services, Spadard Builder Supply, Usabelli Coal Mine, and by First National Bank of Alaska. Welcome back to the Fairbanks Evening News. The asphyxiation death of a dog dropped from the Iditarod Trail sled dog race has outraged animal rights activists who have long criticized the thousand mile race as cruel. People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals is urging Alaska prosecutors to file cruelty charges for those responsible for the death of five-year-old Dorado, who died after being buried by drifting snow at a checkpoint. The dog belonged to the team of rookie musher Paige Dropney. Her husband, Cody Strath, said the couple has asked race managers to implement changes to how dropped dogs are cared for. The Family Friendly Workplace Awards are given to businesses that help make it easier for employers to take care of their families and nurture young children. Now this program has been running for 11 years and the participation from employees has resulted in 352 businesses receiving the quote Family Friendly Workplace Award. The nomination period is open from March 18th through the 29th. More information or nomination forms can be obtained by going to www.fnsb.us or by calling the number 459-1287. The Family Friendly Workplace Awards is um, the Borough's Early Childhood Commission saying thank you to the employers of Fairbanks that provide assistance to their employees in balancing work and uh, family life, the demands of both. Uh, it's recognizing that the good work that the employers do that helps their employees, their families, and in return helps the employers. Soldiers at Fort Wainwright today celebrated National Women's History Month. The theme of the celebration was women inspiring innovation through imagination, celebrating women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The purpose for this event was to celebrate the many achievements of women and cross-cultural diversity. March was declared National Women's History Month in 1987. Each year during Women's History Month, a special presidential proclamation is issued, which honors the extraordinary achievements of American women. This month is Women's History Month, March 1st through March 31st, and this year we're celebrating women in the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I'm a U.S. Army medic, and I couldn't, I wouldn't be in this field had it not been for the women of the past in those fields. Continuing with Fort Wainwright, today soldiers engaged in sling load training to teach gun crews and pilots how to effectively hook up equipment and transport it to remote areas seen in Afghanistan and here in Alaska. Now, what's unique about the training? No other unit does it in these extreme temperatures. Soldiers from Artillery Battalion practiced honing their sling loading techniques with M777 howitzers to Chinook helicopters. Get on the, the howitzer. They rig up sling legs to them and they set it up so that the helicopters can come in and pick them up. A lot of these guys, it's their first time doing it. It's great practice for them. Let them get to work together as a team for the first time. And it lets us uh, work with the aviation guys. The wind chill from the backwash of the blades can literally knock a person off of their feet and reach dangerously low temperatures that the soldiers have to combat while rigging the load. I think today we uh, saw negative 10. Uh, it was about the temperature when we got out here. And with that wind pushing down, it's probably wind chills around negative 50, negative 60 for a few minutes. In those few minutes with the extreme winds and low wind chill temperatures, the process has many steps. You got four. Uh, sling legs that you extend down, they attach onto these little uh, mounts, these hooks up underneath, and they use the chains to attach it up underneath. There's uh, two hooks on the front and the back of the, the chin hook. So what you're seeing there, like I said, it's the end result. It's them running out. It's just connecting it up. They got a little hook that comes down, and they, they attach that last little part of the leg up there, and they get out. The teams on the ground work together to get the mission accomplished. They've got each one of those individual crew chiefs is responsible for his individual gun and making sure it's been rigged properly. Uh, that's a big responsibility for them, obviously, with the 10,000-pound piece of equipment. 
picking up over their soldiers' heads. The Military Report is brought to you by Stanley Nissan. Innovation for all. So I was blown away, literally, today. Yeah. Literally. And now I'm blown away because D Lou's with wow. us. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Stephanie, I love hanging with y'all, mm -hmm. man. <laughs> Sports. Yeah. It's all about the madness. Uh -huh. Starting up down to 3A, 4A teams. Starting later on this week. And um, 1A, 2A wrapping up wrapping up tonight. All right. Come on Tell back, we'll more. talk about it. <laughs> Sports is next. <laughs> And welcome back, Interior Alaska. Don't adjust your television. Daryl Lewis here in the sports seat for Joe Cook, who took off today and is down in Alaska's largest city, getting ready to experience the strength that is March Madness Alaska. We'll be hearing more from him later this week. And speaking of March Madness Alaska, it's all about just that. And why not start with the defending champions, the 3A defending state champion Monroe Catholic Boys, back for another year of dancing and looking to repeat. Now, Monroe coaches and fellows alike may not want to admit it, but the regular season pretty much a dress rehearsal for state. And while they're taking things one game at a time, they've got their collective eyes trained on a possible state final showdown with Anchorage Christian School, the 2011 state champions who beat, you guessed it, Monroe in that finals game. Rams came back in 2012, making it to the finals and beating, yep, ACS. I think you know where I'm going with this. Third time around, the tiebreaker. But as I said earlier, first things first. It make, it, the losses and the bumps, that makes me feel good about it. It, makes us, it shows what we need to work on to get better. And uh, I feel like it's definitely helped us out. It's very important because if we look ahead, somebody, uh, somebody can definitely upset us. And uh, we're playing two. If we have E-Grace, we're playing another quality team. So we can't look by anybody. So. The whole idea is to get better, you know, throughout the course of the season. Um, we often tell our guys nobody cares, you know, who the best team is in December and January. And, and uh, you know, we get an opportunity this, uh, this week to find out if, if we are playing our best basketball at the right time. And on the girls' side, first they were out. Now they're in. The Lathrop girls, thanks to the WPI, made their way into the state tournament festivities. So Dotna left out in the cold. For these Lady Malamutes, it's the first trip to the grand stage in years. And for the seniors, their first trip to state, period. Thrilled and understatement. Well, this is, this is my first time ever going, you know, in my four years of basketball. So, I mean, I, I want it really bad. I want to show people that Lathrop shouldn't be underrated. You know, we, we can be underdogs, but then again, we can come out on top. Yeah, we thought we weren't, and then we were. I know, I was happy and jumping around and screaming, but I think we're all happy. Tell you what, that's like from day one. When we came out from day one, our ultimate goal was to make it to the state tournament, if you remember me telling you. Uh, take one game at a time, you know. We, uh, we took one game at a time. We prepared ourselves. We won, we won 17 out of, what is it, 17 and 8. We were 17 and 8. And... Uh, we, we made it, we made it, we made a way for us to be there, and we're there. Now those close to the madness have already seen changes taking place down in Alaska's largest city and with the tournament itself. Officials with the Alaska High School Activities Association say the tournament field for 1A and 2A schools has increased from eight boys and girls teams to 16 teams each. That and a conflict with the Sullivan Arena during this time also forced the entire party to be moved back a week. They say the time changes were necessary and admittedly had already affected a great many, namely tournament bound 3A and 4A schools who had to wait two and a half weeks between the last regular season game and the first game of the tournament. ASAA officials I spoke to recently say many ideas were brought to the table, including bringing the 2013 tournament to Fairbanks. But in the end, they say, staying in Alaska's largest city was the final decision. We have uh, a staff meeting. We talked about it in staff. We also then got the ASAA board together after we informed them so they could talk with some people. Now, who they talked with, I couldn't speak to that. But we did go through our channels and far, as far as that. The board then approved after we exhausted a lot of options and, and thoughts. I mean, thoughts were, well, what about maybe Fairbanks or having it played in the local high schools in Anchorage? And it all basically won't 
boiled down to and came back around to the Sullivan. And unfortunately, that was the best option out of ones that were not very good. And tomorrow night, hockey preview as the Fairbanks Ice Dogs travel to Soldotna this weekend to face off with the Kenai River Brown Bears. And round ball, not the only sport taking part in state championship performances this weekend. Gymnastics also in the mix. And the interior will be well represented. And that's going to do it for sports tonight. Thanks for rolling with me for a spell. For more KTVF Sports, log on to Twitter, YouTube, WebCenter11.com, and download our mobile app, whatever's your flavor. But for now, don't go anywhere because my man Mike Schultz has your full weather forecast. He's coming up next, and we'll see you. Hello, everyone. Welcome back into the Fairbanks Evening News. Mike Schultz with you once again, taking a look at weather. And, of course, we'll start off with another great photograph sent in by one of our viewers. This is what uh, we we'll call the spirit of the race. A nice uh, job of capturing the open North American race last week that was held. This is sent in by Tom Schneider, and we appreciate that, Tom. If you have a photograph to share, by all means, send it to Mike Schultz at KTVF11.com. Our numbers look like this. Normally, our normal high is 26, not even close today. 11 degrees right now at the airport. Two degrees below zero for the overnight low, the normal low. Record high in 1981, 50 degrees that day, 44 below in 1930. And our sunrise and sunset works out to 12 hours and 12 minutes, a gain of seven minutes from yesterday. A few more clouds in the picture than there were yesterday. Some moving across southeast Alaska, but more dropping down from the north. That's where we're expecting some cloudiness moving in and possibly squeezing out a few flakes of snow here and there across the state right now. Things are fairly quiet for the most part. More clouds across southwest part of the state. Nice weather has moved in over southeast Alaska for the first time in a long time. Sunshine around Nome and some partly cloudy skies at Barrow. Port Yukon also partly cloudy. Lower 48 weather. Again, we're talking about more rain over the Pacific Northwest. And it's a cold rain, too. Even though it's 52 degrees, they're looking at temperatures in the 30s in the next few days. Elsewhere across the country, nice weather across the Central Plains. A little bit of snow falling around the New York area. Over the uh, satellite picture, you can see a lot of energy moving across the Great Lakes. More snow showers expected there. But the biggest storm system is moving in across the Pacific Northwest, bringing in a lot of cold air with it. That's what this little splotchy clouds is indicating a lot of cold air moving across the warmer temperatures. Now, this Palm Sunday looks like a pretty pretty inter interesting weekend for snow potential, also for severe thunderstorms over much of the deep south. Got to keep an eye on that, and that'll be all heading off to the northeast. Well, back to uh, our satellite, or actually our, our uh, five-day outlook. Let, let me try it again. The jet stream outlook, as you can see, the change now is moving down from the north, bringing all that cold air in, moving across the central portions of the country, and then exiting across the, the uh, east coast. But, oh, boy, look, look at all the weather that's going to be associated with that storm. That'll be interesting to keep an eye on. Okay, back to Alaska for tomorrow. Snow for Barrow, partly cloudy in Nome, and flurries for the Fort Yukon area. Here in the interior, we'll be looking at uh, snow showers in Fairbanks, flurries at Healy over southeast Alaska. Finally, things clearing up there. Scattered clouds for Juneau, but still some rain and snow showers expected in Ketchikan over to the southwest. Looks like some snow at Bethel with uh, cloudy skies at Cold Bay and then partly cloudy in Kodiak. And over the south central sections, Anchorage and valleys will be mostly sunny. Some clouds at Homer. Time once again for our kids' weather. And tonight, as all the, we've been doing this week, we'll be talking with another young child from the Immaculate Conception School. And she has a question for me. Hello, my name is Pamela Noel, Miss Ward's class from ICS. And my question for the weatherman is, what year was the coldest year in Fairbanks, Alaska? Well, Pamela, I'm, gl I'm glad I wasn't here in 1934. That's temperature dropped down to 66 below zero. That's the all-time record. That's some very cold weather. Tomorrow night, the teacher will be here with a unique weather fact. Okay, here's your forecast for tonight. The remainder of the night, looking at 10 below. Increasing clouds with some snow flurries by morning. Tomorrow's forecast, looking again at 18 degrees for the high. Early flurries with maybe some snow possible later on tomorrow afternoon into tomorrow evening. No accumulation expected. And our extended forecast, as you can see here, looking at temperatures near 30 degrees each day and then cooling off by the end of the five-day period. Overnight lows will be in the zero to plus category, which is okay. And uh, again, we're not looking at any kind of real strong weather outbreaks at all. So the temperatures will stay just about where they are, except for that cooler air moving in by the end of the five-day period. It definitely did feel colder today. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, you should know. Well, you were... under, yeah, under that <laughs> helicopter, I experienced 60 below today. And let yeah. me tell you something, 
What? That's not fun. Yeah. <laughs> no, I That's can not imagine. Fun. I was blown away by your story. Oh, um, yeah. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> blown away. <laughs> so was I. All right. Well, that will wrap up this edition of the Fairbanks Evening News. As always, we're so glad you could join us. Tonight on NBC Nightly News, the latest on President Obama's first trip to Israel as president. That's next with Brian Williams. And a note from the Bureau, the Westcott Pool at North Pole is closed tomorrow for mechanical repairs. More on that when we get more information. From all of us here at the News Center, have a good evening. Good night.